him. Okay, here comes the lecture video I promised because Monday you took your test and we had a little bit of stuff to cover. I drew out mitosis and meiosis on the board and I went, I thought, into a decent little bit of depth about it in class, but we didn't have time to do this whole thing. We did a vote. You voted for me to do the lecture video, so I'm finally getting it done. Now, just so you know, it's cold. Um, I've already done two other lecture video things before this and I, I keep coughing and so if I sound rough, I'm sorry, I will do my best. Some of this I'm going to kind of like brush over, others I'm going to go more into depth and basically if there's anything that you feel I didn't cover enough right off the bat, just let me know. Email me, ask me questions. I'll try to clarify a little bit more. So without further ado, chapter eight. We're gonna talk about some cancer stuff. Now, that being said, there's also videos involved in this. And just like before, I'm gonna recommend you watch the videos. And I, I'm actually thinking the hybrid lecture assignment might have to do with the videos embedded in this PowerPoint just to cause you to have to do it. Just so you know. Anyway. We're gonna talk about cancer cells, what happens with it, how our cells normally reproduce, and then what that means with cancer, okay? So, can cancer therapy be personalized? This means, can they take your own personal genetic information in order to get rid of cancer? So, cell division and reproduction, eukaryotic cell cycle and mitosis, Meiosis and crossing over, I mentioned this also when I drew it on the board, and alternations of chromosome number and structure. So starting with cell division and reproduction. Your textbook does not go into this, but I think it's imperative to talk about Henrietta Lack. Phenomenal, phenomenal story, very much not enough information out there in my opinion, but we're getting more and more out there. So Henrietta Lacks is a lady. She died of cancer in 1951. She was only 31 years old, but her cells, they are still growing in laboratories to this day. Notice 1951 is when she died. The cells are called HeLa cells because back in the day they didn't really care about patient confidentiality and so everything was labeled with the first two letters of the first name and the first two letters of the last name. So HeLa for Henrietta Lacks. Um, she had cancer. Well, obviously she died of cancer, so she had cancer. They had some of her cells and they've just basically kept letting them divide. And the cells have been used to investigate so many different effects on human cells. So they have tested things about cancer, viral growth, protein synthesis, effects of radiation. <clears throat> Her cells were also the first human cells sent off into space to see how space travel would affect human cells. It was used to help figure out um, uh, like in vitro fertilization and a whole bunch of stuff. So Henrietta Lacks cells were used constantly to figure out how to do things. So this is showing the cells reproducing, it's them dividing, and this is Henrietta Lacks. Now, why I think this is a very important thing to mention, other than we have her cells to thank for the leaps and bounds made in the medical and scientific field, is <coughs> it was not deemed like a personal product. We needed the cells, helped us tremendously, got us where we are now, but her family was never uh, compensated for any of this. So while the science and medical industry made a buttload of money on all of this, Henrietta Lacks ancestors, uh, or her descendants, I'm sorry, her descendants couldn't even afford basic medical care because they were not rich people. And this was something that was overlooked for so long until more and more people learned about the HeLa cells. And there's actually a book out there, and I want to say it's called The Immortal Cells of Henrietta Lacks. Um, <clears throat> but there's a book that talks all about the history of this 
and the person wrote it and published it so the proceeds would go to Henrietta Lacks' descendants. And so they're actually finally getting compensated for all of this. And so, I don't know. I just think it needs to be mentioned all the time. And I was a little sad that the book didn't have it there. So that brings us to cell division. We have asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction. Asexual just basically means it's exactly the same genetic copy as the parent, identical. Sexual reproduction is creating a variety because it's blending it from two different sources. So what function does cell division play in an amoeba and what functions does it play in your body? So for an amoeba, it's reproduction because the amoeba is just literally, that's how it reproduces. For our body, our body does have asexual reproduction for our cells, and that is for the development, the growth, and the repair. So when you're talking about mitosis for the cells, that's the important part is development, growth, and repair. I think in class I said that it was multiply by divide, or by division. So this is just showing you a cell dividing. So this would be telophase because it's about to pinch off. It hasn't pinched off yet. Once it pinches off, that will have been the cytoplasmic division. Um, <clears throat> this shows a sea star reproducing asexually. So it just like broke off an arm and then the arm grows into a whole nother sea star. Pretty cool, right? A lot of plants, you can actually take one leaf and plant it and it will grow a whole new plant. So that is also asexual. People, however, nope, ours is sexual reproduction. Ours is blending of a whole bunch of different genes, which is why you can make one family, everybody looks a little bit different. Uh, prokaryotic cells reproduce asexually by binary fission. That means literally it's dividing in half. So in a typical prokaryote, most genes are carried on one circular DNA molecule that's that's right there because if you remember prokaryotes do not have an actual nucleus they have dna but not a nucleus it still is going to replicate then it moves and it pinches and gets you the two daughter cells like what i drew on the board so why is binary fission classified as asexual because the identical offspring has the dna from a single parent so again identical daughter cells so notice it's one and then it separates into two identical daughter cells. So this would be, again, example of mitosis. This is just showing you the division. Now, eukaryotic cell, eukaryote, true nucleus, so these have a nucleus. So here's the eukaryotic cell cycle and mitosis. This is the first one I drew on Monday. We have a chromosome, contains one long DNA molecule. Um, I was hoping for a good picture. The chromosome is going to duplicate, and that's when it looks like the X. So that's going to be the chromosome. So you're going to have two sister chromatids. They have identical DNA. They're joined together at the very center. That little, that little spot in the middle where they touch as the X is called the centromere. Cell division is going to be separating those two from each other to go into two different cells. Um, when does a chromosome consist of two identical chromatids? Well, when it's preparing to divide because it has to have duplicated itself. So you've got the one strand that duplicates, but it's connected with that one spot from where it duplicated. And then if you remember when I said the PMAT, it's going to condense, line up, and then pull apart. So sister chromatids that way. Here's the example. So sister chromatid, sister chromatid, chromosome duplicates, chromatid, chromatid, centromere where they touch, and then they get separated into two different cells. Cell cycle is an ordered sequence of events that extends from the time a cell is first formed from dividing, uh, yeah, from a dividing parent cell until its own division. <coughs> Sorry. A researcher treats cells with a chemical that prevents the DNA synthesis from starting. This treatment would trap the cells in which part of the cell cycle? Well, considering you haven't looked at the cell cycle yet, I don't think you can answer this question, but we're about to have a picture about it. 
The answer, of course, is going to be G1, but here's why. This is the way it tends to work. So most of its life is going to be here in interphase. So G1 is the first gap. Then here is the DNA synthesis. So S is synthesis. And then G2 is the second gap. And then it finally gets to mitosis. This is where it's going to reproduce. Most of the time it goes through G1 and then it hits this little stopping point, a checkpoint, and it says, do, you know, do we really need to replicate? And if it doesn't, it just kind of hangs out here. So that's what it was asking about. I can pause there. If it gets here, it's like, all right, it's time to replicate. Here is where it starts reproducing the DNA, synthesizing. So it is duplicating the DNA here. Here's where it's prepping, and then here is mitosis. So here's where the PMAT takes place, right here. Um, after the chromosome's coiled up, remember I talked about how it goes squish and condenses? Mitotic spindle made of the microtubules moves the chromosome to the middle of the cell. So that is going to be the M for PMAT. You view an animal cell through a microscope and observe a dense duplicated chromosome scattered throughout the cell. What state of mitosis are you witnessing? Well, what do you think? It's all squished up. Prophase, because remember, PMAT, prophase, prophase, crunched up, huddle up, prophase. That's the beginning part. This is showing you interphase, it's just the normal stuff. Prophase, it's all getting condensed. And then prometa, I don't make you memorize that. That is the process of it starting to organize because here it just looks all bunched. Here they're starting to organize. These are the, the spindle fibers that are going to end up connecting. Brings you here, metaphase, remember lined up, 50 yard line. And then, yeah, metaphase, anaphase, they're pulling apart. So that's the ball in play. Telophase, separate areas. Notice this is the cleavage furrow. So this is where it's not yet broken. So this is telophase. It is not um, finished until it has completely separated. Here is one of the videos that you are supposed to watch. Um, I would do it for you, but again, since I'm having to post this one on YouTube, it's going to tag me. It is so goofy, but if you watch it, one, oh, he tries. He tries so hard. Um, it will help you remember all the phases. It, it seriously will. So now I have to do my getting more comfy again. Cytokinesis. This is where the cell divides into two. Cyte, remember, cyte is cell. So this is where it's breaking it in two. Animals, this happens with cleavage furrow. So it, like I said, it pinches it and then separates it. For plants, it builds a new wall. So that's a cell plate. It builds a little plate in between the two. That becomes the new cell wall. That's what makes them two different plant cells. Contrast cytokinesis in animals with cytokinesis in plants. I literally just said it. Right there. Plants, cleavage, cleavage for a pinch, separate. And a uh, plant cell, wall, separate. There you go, we're done. Here's a picture of a cleavage happening for the animal cell. When I say a pinch is, seriously, that's what it is. Cleavage for a pinch. Think of if you've ever like twisted a balloon. You have that one balloon, you twist it like that and suddenly it looks like two. That's pretty much it, except it goes all the way through and comes up to be two separate cells. Plant cell. Slowly starts putting these pieces here, builds the cell plate. Once it reaches the two ends, it is a new cell wall. So that's the difference for the plant versus the animal. Uh, in laboratory cultures, most normal cells divide only when attached to a surface. So the cultured cells continue dividing until they touch one another. Most animal cells divide only when stimulated by growth factors, and some of them do not divide at all. So some cells are not going to repair and replace your brain cells or some of those. That's why I protect your brain. So compared with control culture, 
Cells in experimental culture are fewer but much larger in size when they cover the dish surface and stop growing. What is a reasonable hypothesis for this difference? Well, because it's deficient in one or more growth factors. You have to feed them, basically. This is just trying to show you what they're doing. We've got it where it's anchored, single layer cells. They remove one. Restoration of single layer by cell division. So it filled up its space. It only stopped growing when it touched the sides. They took some out in the middle. And it's like these cells went, holy crap, there's a hole. And then they just grew enough to fill and then they stopped again. This is an example of the normal cell replication thing because it's trying to repair itself as it goes. This, however, is what happens with the cancer cells because it just doesn't stop replicating. Where these were all touching, so they said, we're done, we need to chill. Cancer cells, they just keep on, keep on, keep on, keep on, keep on. Um, showing you with the cultured cells. So just image of what we already talked about. Skipping on over that one. Skipping on over that one because I want to get here. So here we go. Cell cycle. We've got G1. Here's one of those checkpoints I was talking about before it gets here. It's like, okay, beep. What do we need to do? Well, typically, if the cell is damaged, if it's not good, or if they don't need to replicate, they have plenty, this would be like, stop, we're not going anywhere else. <clears throat> if they're like, oh, wait, there's space, then this lifts, and then it goes to the synthesis. It goes to the S phase, and then here. Here it stops again because it's a little checkpoint saying, okay, are you actually properly duplicated? because it wants to make sure it's a good, healthy, proper cell. And then once it's deemed it's a good, healthy, necessary growth cell, then it goes into reproduce. So that kind of thing. Um, just showing you more of exactly what's happening, the growth factor, the proteins, that kind of thing. Now that brings us to cancer. Cancer cells divide excessively to form masses called tumors. We have malignant tumors that can invade other tissues. Malignant means it's going into something else. Benign me means that it's harmless. Radiation and chemotherapy are effective as cancer treatments because they interfere with cell division. What happens with radiation and chemotherapy is it is attacking the fast replicating cells because cancer cells are growing Quickly. They're growing out of control. They're like bypassing the checkpoints. So radiation and chemotherapy are targeting the fast growing or fast replicating cells. This is also the reason why there's so much hair loss when you're getting cancer treatments is because your hair cells are also the ones that grow very, very quickly. So while it's targeting the very quickly growing cells, it tends to also target the hair cells. So this is trying to show you about a malignant tumor in the breast. So we have tumor found here, so that'd be like if you noticed a lump, and then it's going to grow, so it starts invading all the other parts. What happens when it invades is it's getting into the circulation system, whether it is your actual circulation, like your blood system or your lymphatic system. I always refer to them as like the super highway through your body. Once it gets into there, it can go anywhere it wants to because the issue with the cancer cells is they are not anchored. So they can just kind of go through and, whew, and take off somewhere else and then decide that's where they're going to plant. So this is showing you after it hit that super highway of the body and then it comes back out and attaches somewhere else. That is why early detection is key. Um, one of the other lecture videos I did today, I was talking about cancer and talking about in 2018 when my aunt passed away of cancer, it was my mom's twin sister. and. Um, I knew it was over before it was officially announced that it was over because 
she had some issues. She went to the doctor. They said, oh, everything's fine. She knew something wasn't right, so she got a second opinion. That's when she found out she had ovarian cancer. They did a full hysterectomy. Everyone's like, yes, they removed everything. Everything's great. And then they said, but there was a small bit that they found in a lymph node, at which point I knew it was over um, because the lymph node is part of the lymphatic system and it's a whole super highway through the whole body and as soon as that one piece got in there that meant it could be anywhere at all in her body and that's actually what happened it was only a month later when they then announced that it had spread to other areas long story short she passed away due to all the cancer complications in less than a year from her her initial di diagnosis it was it was fast and it was disturbing, um, but there you go. So, mortality rates from cancer vary by age of diagnosis, race, and other factors. You have to take all of this data into account when you're looking at a cancer treatment. So, why must human cancer research often use observational method when controlled studies could yield more definitive results? Well, because of what we just said, so many different things are based on this. This is why there is no official cancer cure yet. There are so many things that can knock everything out of whack and so many things that might help different people in different ways it's made. Because cancer is literally your own body going crazy. Um, something has messed up that cell cycle, that, that replication factor, and it also kicks out its stuff its own little growth hormones. And so they replicate faster, they're screaming out for more food, they're taking more food away from the healthy cells surrounding it, and that's why it can spread so fast. So here they're showing death rates due to breast cancer from a huge study. We've got the age where they were diagnosed, and then we also have ethnicity. So there's different rates of this and huge survival rate, mostly dependent on finding out when the person was diagnosed. This is why it's important to pay attention. And just so you know, men can also get breast cancer. It's not just a women's thing. So uh, guys need to keep an eye on this as well. So I add this part in. This is not from the regular PowerPoint. I added this because I wanted to go a little more in depth and make sure you really understood the cancer aspect. I mentioned a moment ago about malign, uh, malign, benign and malignant. Benign neoplasm is something that grows slowly, stays in one place, not cancer. So this would be like a mole. I have a mole here and I have another one on the back of my neck. A lot of people have moles. Looks like a raised freckle, basically. Doesn't move, doesn't change throughout your life. That means it's benign. If you have a mole that has always been a certain way and then suddenly it becomes a little different, that is concerning because it might become malignant. So just because something is a benign neoplasm like a mole does not mean it will always be benign. That's why you have to keep an eye on it. You have to keep track of it. Malignant is cancer. That's where it messes up all the body tissues around it, both physically and metabolically. That goes with the growth fact, the yeah, the growth hormone factor I was talking about and taking the nutrients from the surrounding cells. Um, <clears throat> So if you have any kind of marks on your body and it, they suddenly start to look a little different or if a new one appears, get it checked. So we have three characteristics of cancer cells. Again, the cancer cells grow and divide abnormally. So not normal, it starts to increase. Cytoplasm and the plasma membrane are altered. Looks a little different. I should have a picture in a second here. And cancer cells have altered recognition proteins and weakened adhesion. This is where I was talking about how it can then let go and move through the body. This is the image I prefer because I think it really drives it home. This would be the benign, like a mole. So you would see one part, but notice this is all just kind of hooked up. If you look at it, all the cells still look pretty much normal. 
This is more of the Cancer one. They're not shaped the same. They're a little off, they're a little odd. But then they can also let go and they can move. They can come in here, go into that super highway I was talking about and shoot, shoot down and then come out. And then they can adjust somewhere else. Not adjust, attach somewhere else. So each year, cancer causes 15 to 20% of all human deaths in developed countries. Lifestyle choices like not smoking and avoiding exposure of unprotected skin to sunlight can reduce the risk. Does not matter how light or dark skinned you are, you are at risk of skin cancer. So you are supposed to be very careful about how much skin is uh, exposed to sunlight. Um, and then of course, your regular screenings, pap smears, the pap test, dermatology exams, being checked out by a doctor. So here are the skin cells or skin cancers. I started to say skin cells, skin cancers. We have basal cell carcinoma. That is the most common type of skin cancer. Let me repeat that. Basal cell carcinoma. The reason I'm saying this is I want you to tell me about this in your lecture assignment. I want to know that basal cell carcinoma is the most common type of skin cancer. That is the assignment. And it will also be a question on your next test, just so you know. So learn basal cell carcinoma is the most common type of skin cancer. Now we have another video. It's a little chipmunk out there. He's so cute. Anyway. This is a video that tells you all about the cell cycle in cancer. I highly recommend watching it. And then this is another one about mitosis and it will totally break mitosis down, make it super easy to understand. I highly recommend it. In class, I show it, but we didn't have time. That brings me to meiosis and crossing over. So we talked about mitosis, now we are on meiosis. So we have the somatic cells, which are the body cells. Each species contains a specific number of chromosomes. For example, human cells have 46 chromosomes. That means we have 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes. 23 pairs because we get 23 chromosomes from mom, 23 chromosomes from dad. The chromosomes of the homologous pair, homologous, homo, same, so this is going to be similar, <coughs> carry genes for the same characteristics at the same place, or it's called the locus. This is leading us up to when we start talking about genetics very, 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 very soon, like I think next week. So checkpoint question, are all of your chromosomes fully homologous? Uh-uh. If you are a girl, yes because if you were born female, you have an XX chromosome. That's your sex chromosomes. You have an X for mom and an X from dad. So those are still similar. But if you are male, if you were born male, you have an XY chromosome. You got your X from mom because mom only has an X to give and you got a Y from dad. Those are not similar to each other. So there you go. Pair of homologous chromosomes. This is just showing you that they're very similar to each other. Locus, the centromere, that's the part where they touch. The sister chromatids, remember one side is one chromatid, the other is another chromatid. So that is the duplicated chromosome as it gets ready to reproduce. Cells with two sets of homologous chromosomes are called diploid because DI for two. The gametes, the egg and sperm, so the egg is one gamete, that's the female gametophyte, gamete, gamete sorry. Uh, the sperm is the male gamete. So egg, female gamete, sperm, male gamete. These are haploid cells with a single set of chromosomes. Haploid because it's only one. So haploid one, diploid two. You're going to have to see this a lot because you're going to see a little N for haploid and you're going to see a 2N for diploid. And that is going to be for the rest of by a 1, 2, 3 and in 1, 2, 4. Sexual life cycles involve the alternation of haploid and diploid stages. So 
showing you here right here the humans the entire organism we have diploid 2n because we have 46 chromosomes again 23 from mom 23 from dad however the egg that's kicked out or the sperm that's kicked out is a haploid because it's only from one person so our haploid gametes we have again the egg for the female the sperm for the male these have exactly 23 chromosomes then they fertilize to make the egg at this point not the egg the zygote the sperm gets into the egg fertilizes and that is our zygote that is a diploid because now we have 23 chromosomes from mom and 23 chromosomes from dad into our diploid <coughs> how it works. Alrighty, we have our part where the chromosomes are duplicating, the sister chromatids, the homologous chromosomes separate, so in meiosis 1, if you remember, I showed you that it ended in X's. And then meiosis 2, the X's turn into lines. So that's literally what this is showing. It's just making it very, very short, but we'll go in depth again in just a moment. So meiosis like mitosis is uh, done by chromosome duplication, but in meiosis, the cell divides twice to form four daughter cells. So mitosis, you have the main cell that ends in two identical daughter cells. In meiosis, you have the one cell that ends in four daughter cells. Notice I did not say identical because they are not identical. Mitosis, one to two identical, meiosis one to four there you go so first division meiosis one starts with the pairing of homologous chromosomes crossing over is where it can exchange segments talked about this in class and i said it's because when it all bunches up sometimes it twists up and when they separate it pulls parts from the other meiosis one separates the members of each homologous pair and then meiosis two is pretty much the same as mitosis where it all ends up in haploids. So a cell has the haploid number of chromosomes but each chromosome has two chromatids. Chromosomes are arranged singly at the center of the spindle. What is the meiotic stage? That would be metaphase 2. Knowing metaphase because it's the center so that would be metaphase. It's metaphase 2 because it's pulling apart the chromatids. There you go. All right, getting ready. Prophase one, crunched up, crossing over. That crossing over is the big key for prophase one. It only ever happens in prophase one. I cannot stress that enough. Metaphase lines up, 50 yard line, just like I was talking about. Anaphase, X's pull to the opposite sides. Telophase one, we now have cytokinesis, so now we have two cells. So when I was drawing it, I just did a times two here. Um, instead of drawing it twice, you can do it either way you want. So then we have prophase two, it's all just getting ready. Metaphase two, again, 50 yard line. Anaphase two, ball and play. Notice now that the X's are getting pulled apart from each other. And then telophase two, touchdown, opposite sides, but notice now these are singles, not X's. So by my, but bleh, both mitosis and meiosis begin with diploid parent cells that have chromosomes duplicated during the previous interphase. Um, yeah, we already talked about that. I've said this a couple of times already, so I'm not going to worry about it. Now, we are looking at mitosis. Mitosis is on this side. Meiosis 1 over here. So, prophase, condense. Metaphase, line up. Anaphase, pull apart. Telophase, they're separated. I don't know why they just slapped it together. I would like them to have shown both. And then meiosis 2 goes through it all again, and that's where we end up with our haploids. So notice diploid, haploid. So let's see, 2n equals 4, n equals 2. 
um, 2n equals 4. So this ends up exactly the same as here. This one splits up to four totally different things. And I'm looking over there because I keep seeing light. And uh, now it's a bird instead of a chipmunk. There is a lot of life out in my yard today. Okay. Mitosis. Two genetically identical diploid cells. Result for meiosis. Four genetically unique haploid cells. Used for mitosis, used for growth, tissue repair, and asexual reproduction. Meiosis, used for sexual reproduction. This one slide, I think, might answer like half of one of your labs right there. Just so you know. Okay, so each chromosome of a homologous pair differs at many points from the other member of the pair. The random arrangements of the chromosome pair at metaphase one of meiosis can lead to many different combinations of the chromosomes. Random fertilization of eggs by sperm will greatly increase this variation. So this is that whole random assortment thing. We are going to touch on it here, but we go so much more into this when we are talking genetics, just so you know. So, particular species of worm has a diploid number of 10. How many chromosomal combinations are possible for gametes formed by meiosis? 32. Because 2n equals 10, because they just told us that, that means n equals 5, and 2 to the n is 32. Um, I know this looks weird, but it says diploid number of 10, so that's how we have 2n. If you remember doing math, and I am going to try this. I have never tried this. I'm going to try. Let's see. Uh, pen. I will do blue. Okay, so if you had this, you would divide both sides by 2. Woo! Which gives you n equals 5, right? Yes, because 10 divided by 2 equals 5. Now, you need to know how many chromosomal combinations are there. Well, in order to make it a diploid, you have to have 2, and that's why you are going to now do 2. And we know that n equals 5. So 2 to the fifth power equals 32. And that is how you figure it out. And I wrote that horribly, but I'm still going to do this and go, <laughs> yay. All right. Um, that was kind of fun, actually. Ooh. I'm going to show you one other thing real quick because it amuses me greatly. Have you ever noticed, and I know this has nothing to do with this, but hey, I've been doing this for a while. I am a little uh, tired of doing it. If you have a smiley face like this and you just draw eyebrows like that, it makes it a totally different beast. All right, I am going back to the laser pointer because I should not have access to a pen because I am too distracted. Anyway, independent orientation of chromosomes at metaphase one. Um, it's showing you that it could be totally switched up. It's just showing you here, this is one possibility, here's another possibility. So when they line up, how they line up partially dictates the variability. Because now, metaphase two, look how different those are. Then at the end of all of meiosis, look at all the combos you can have. So just by having these, you can have this many different combinations. This is what accounts for a lot of the variability between you and, say, if you have a brother or a sister. There you go. So crossing over, exchange of corresponding segments between non-sister chromatids of homologous chromosomes. That is what adds to so many differences. So again, this is just showing you the same kind of thing where it's showing, uh, this is getting into genetics. I hate when they go too much into it before we've touched on it. But they're showing you here, we have brown and black, we have white and pink. And so this one, brown and black, you see here, this one, white and pink. If these two guys have babies, if there's a crossover, then we could end up with white and black or brown and pink. So that's what it's showing you here, where it 
crosses over. This switches and that switches. And so that makes a slightly different result. Um, if you were to examine a chromosome from one of your gametes, is it likely to look exactly like the same chromosome from one of your skin cells? Well, what do you think? Because mm -hmm. each chromosome probably looks like a cut and paste hybrid of segments derived from a pair of homologous chromosomes. You, you have plenty of stuff just moving around, that's all. Now, crossing over further increases genetic variability. So it's just stepping you through, showing you paternal means dad, maternal means mom. So we're showing the blue came from dad and the red came from mom. So now we are going to start going through here. We're going to show a crossing over. And then it ends up, look how different we can be. We now have complete utter variations. This one would look just like dad. This one would look just like mom. This one would look more like dad, but have some like mom. This one would look more like mom, but show some of dad. And if you think about it, that is kind of, these are more likely what you tend to see with you and your siblings, your parents and whatnot. So this is just all the words to go with the pictures that we just covered to uh, talk about that. Alternations of chromosome number and structure. So here we're going to talk a little bit about something called non-disjunction, important to remember. In class, uh, yeah, in class when I was talking about it, I talked about if it does not separate properly, it's non-disjunction. And non-disjunction means too many chromosomes go here, not enough go there. So you might have something called trisomy, which means you have three instead of two of a certain chromosome. If you have 23 from mom and 23 from dad and you have 46 chromosomes, that means you are supposed to have two of each of the chromosomes. So if you have three of one chromosome, that's a, huh? Something went wrong. So that's what this checkpoint is about. Diploid gamete would result if the non-junction affected all the chromosomes during one of the meiotic divisions. And we will have a picture. So here we go. Meiosis one. These chromosomes are separating and it's separating here, but for some reason these two are like, nah, nah, we're not letting go. So this time one chromosome got pulled here and two of them got pulled to this side. Well, then you go to meet uh, meiosis two. This time they separated the way they're supposed to. So if you drew a line straight here, this cell is this one. And so now it's separated and it has one sister chromatid, one chromatid, one chromatid. Again, we drew the line right here. So this one is here. And now this one has three instead of two. This is trisomy right here because it is three. There you go. N plus one trisomy and minus one uh, monosomy because mono for one normal goes this way. Then we get to meiosis two and it messes up and it pulls it over here. And so that of course is going to cause another issue here. Again, we have perfectly normal gametes over here, but then messed up gametes over here. And then it all depends which one actually gets to the zygote spot. Now, a lot of these can be identified through something called a karyotype. This is part of your, um, your lab next week. You will be doing an online karyotyping lab. You're going to have to look at it, figure out how it works. You're going to have to identify the abnormalities, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah. So what they do, they take the blood culture, through, put it through the centrifuge, which swirls it around, and then they add the solution, fixative, they put it on here so then they can take a look. This is an example of a karyotype. So we are looking at all these different chromosomes. So if you look at this right here, this is the sex chromosome. Notice these are very similar. Each of these are very, very, very similar. They're not identical, but they are similar. That's how we know these are the, uh, these are the homologous chromosomes. So these are the autosomes, this sex chromosome. So this one has X, Y. So in class, I normally ask you, can you tell if this is a boy or a girl? 
And I will leave it there to see if you can figure it out and answer your own question. So how would the karyotype of a human female differ from the male karyotype? So what here would make it whether it was a boy or a girl? See, we're answering the question anyway. Right there. This is an XY, so that means boy. If it was a girl, it would have XX. Trisomy 21, this is the one I mentioned in class. Most common chromosome number abnormality. This is Down syndrome. So here is the karyotype showing it. You have the two of each of these. You even have the two X's because it's a girl. But notice right here on chromosome number 21, we have three. That is Down syndrome. I'm going to have to go back in here and add the picture that I had from the previous PowerPoint because it's the cutest little kids. I mean, she's pretty cool. She does um, acting. Here is the part that I like people to really pay attention to. Maternal age and the incidence of Down syndrome. After a certain age, the chances of having, I started to say contracting and that's not right, conceiving a child with Down syndrome increases because as the eggs get older, non-disjunction is more likely. Now, later we will cover more genetic issues and some of them it's non-disjunction for the sperm that tends to cause it. But for Down syndrome, it's female. This is also why if you ever look, they have the books of what to expect when you're expecting and what to expect when you're expecting after 30 because things get different after 30. Non-disjunction of the sex chromosomes during meiosis can result in individuals with a missing or an extra, X or Y. So some cases we have XXY, others we have XXX. XXY, this can affect the health of the individual. You will notice something different. Triple X, you don't really notice anything at all. So here are some examples. We will talk more about this later. But we have Klinefelter syndrome. XXY. This one, technically male because you have the Y syndrome. However, what tends to happen is they tend to look a little more female. They have a few more female characteristics. They have uh, breasts. They have wider hips, so more of the hourglass figure that we think of for a female, less of the wedge figure for a male. XYY. No real big difference, it's just there's an extra Y chromosome. Now the interesting thing about this is when they did the studies, they used to think that this was a criminal gene because they were finding that they had more guys, that um, they had guys in jail that had this, but it turned out a lot of, a lot of guys who have this abnormality tended to be a lot taller. And if you're taller, you're more easily picked out of a lineup. So I thought that was interesting. Triple X, no real difference. If you actually look through this, you'll see some basic with small little things. Like here it says slightly taller. And then XO, Turner syndrome. This is the one I was talking about where a lot of times this will be non-disjunction in the sperm. Turner syndrome, the reason it shows XO is they are missing one of the sex chromosomes, and so this will be just an X. Um, talking about the non-disjunction, how it can cause different errors, cause different issues. <coughs> we have things in ooh, we have things in the replication that can cause different mutations. We have deletions, duplications, inversions, and translocations. Each of these can produce a different disorder. We will go a little more into each of these types of things next week. Um, this PowerPoint kind of highlights them, but I like to cover a tiny bit more, so I'm prepping that for you now. So, and this is asking what's the difference between translocation and crossing over. Well, the translocation is swapping certain segments between non-homologous chromosomes, but crossing over is homologous. So this is just a quick little visual trying to help you notice that deletion just means a part of it's deleted. 
duplication, it accidentally duplicates the same part twice. Inversion, it literally flips it. And reciprocal translocation, what we just talked about, where it takes one from one, sticks it to a different one. Um, all of these can cause various mutations. In some species, it might create a whole new species. Other stuff, it might, you know, <clears throat> just cause the, uh, the baby not to survive. So again, we're going to cover all of these later. Look at that. I forgot to delete that part right there. I hate when I do that. So, well, I didn't do any of those. How about that? I know right where it ends, though, don't I? Because it ends right there on number four. So that's pretty much it. Um, definitely practice the drawing and labeling of mitosis and meiosis like I showed you in class on Monday. And the lecture assignment for this week, I told you in this video. So if you came to the very end thinking I was going to tell you now, oops, sorry, there's something very specific in this lecture video that is your actual lecture assignment and um, you need to know it. So there you go. Hope that was decent enough and if you have any questions, seriously, just email me. I'll answer. I will do the best I can and I'm going to start prepping everything for next week. So I can add a little more detail. Yeah, pretty much that it. That's it. Hope everybody's good. I'm going to now rest my throat. So peace out.